Yeah. Wonderful. A very good evening to one and all present. It's my honor and privilege to welcome all the dignitaries and attendees to the launch of India's Road to Transformation, Why Leadership Matters. Before we move any further, I would like to acknowledge the presence of certain dignitaries whose gracious presence we are grateful for at this launch. Dr. Deepak Jain, the VC of Geo University. Dr. Bhim Rai Maitri, the director of IIM Nagpur. Dr. Mahadev Jaiswal, the director of IIM Sambalpur. Dr. Harivansh Chaturvedi, the CAA, CEA of BIMTECH. Dr. Atish Chattopadhyay, the VC of Vijay Bhumi University, Mr. Indrajit Gupta, the editor and founder of Founding Fuels, Mr. Dhananjay Singh, the executive director of NHRDN, Mr. Prem Singh, the president of NHRDN, Mr. Sanjay Parode, the founder of Vijay Bhumi University, Dr. Manoj Tiwari, the director of IIM Mumbai, Dr. Par so Raman, the Pro VC of Vijay Bhumi University, and Mr. Jayan Shah, the Executive Director of the Academy of Indian Marketing. Thank you very much, respected dignitaries, for taking out the time from your busy schedule to join us this evening for this very historic launch. Now, before we move further, I thought, and obviously we are going to be hearing from Dr. Shade itself that what inspired him to write the book and what was his vision behind the book. But before that, just a little bit of introduction. For the ones who have had the pleasure of reading the book like I have had, would have witnessed the huge spectrum and diversity of various topics that the book touches upon. Right from dissecting nation building, a comparative analysis between India and China, the leadership journey of the nation from Pandit Nehru to our current Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi, and India's journey currently towards Viksit Bharat through political and development reforms. All this has been beautifully and comprehensively represented in this book and culminates on how leadership has been key in this transformational journey that the nation is currently undertaking. It is simply wonderful to read how succinctly and crisply such a complex topic has been dealt with by the brilliant authors of this book, Professor Dr. Jagdish Shape and late Mr. Gyanendra Singh. Before we move any further, I would like to request if we can observe a moment of silence to mourn the loss of the co-author of the book, late Mr. Gyanendra Singh. Thank you very much, everybody. Now to share a little bit about our authors of the book, though I'm sure both of them do not need an introduction, especially Professor Dr. Jagdish Shet, because he is such a well-known institution in himself. But I will try to do as best as I can uh, to try to make the introduction. Professor Dr. Jagdish Shet is the Charles H. Kelstad Professor of Business at the Emory University. He is glo globally known for his scholarly contributions to consumer behavior, relationship marketing, competitive strat strategy, and geopolitical analysis. Professor Shaid has over 50 years of combined experience in teaching and research at the University of Southern California, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Columbia University, MIT, and Emory University. Not only that, he has been an advisor to numerous companies, including Whirlpool, Motorola, Texas Instruments, Rockwell International, AT&T, Bell South, Wipro, and many, many more of the Fortune 500 companies that we can think, think of. More importantly, be it globally or be it in the country, 
he's one of the most respected academician you can be today going and speaking to somebody even out of the management domain but if they are from the world of academia it is rather rare that you would find somebody who does not know of the formidable reputation that dr shade has thank you very much sir for the wonderful work and the contribution that you have made to the field of academia and also more importantly the wonderful work that you have done in making sure that india's presence is felt immensely in global academia and especially in leading universities globally thank you very much sir thank you kritika also the co-author of the book who unfortunately is not with us here today late gyanendra singh ji late gyanendra singh ji is a former p and g executive managing partner at the partner uh, at the partnering group and director of the center for retail management at the kellogg school of management late gyanendra singh ji had a diverse career spanning the globe he graduated from the bits pilani in 1968 with a with a degree in chemical engineering and received his ms and mba degrees from the university of illinois in 1970 and 71 He served in the product development, marketing, and management systems for P&G in the U.S. and Japan during 1971 to 1993. He also had in his initial career research and development that led to two patents and new products. Not only this, he also in the later part of his career immensely contributed to the academia world. I wish he was here with us today to discuss the book with us. but nonetheless he has left a huge body and legacy of work and respect which will be deeply remembered our deepest condolences to his family and the and his friends who have joined us here today now before we move any further i think the first question is and what everyone here must be waiting to hear and if i would like to direct that to dr shade is what was your inspiration behind writing this book what was your vision you know how did you and yanendra ji give birth to this idea what were those initial conversations that actually led to the culmination of this beautiful book as very rightly said by somebody that it was such a complex topic but it's amazing to see that how it has been elucidated so simply in the book and explained yes. so simply for numerous people to understand so sir over to you uh originally yani and myself wanted to write a book on product management think about that <laughs> uh he was always wanting to write something with me he had written a book uh, of his own he was expert on uh, product categorization and i would be the academic he would be the practitioner with a combination uh but as he became he retired from procter and gamble and began to visit india more often since 1993 essentially he got very excited about the rise of india in a very different way since the 1991 economic reforms i was of course going into geopolitics wrote a book called chindia rising before that one was a book called tectonic shift and on my journey began in 1990 by working at the government of singapore so i try to motivate him to say let's write a book more about the current administration the leadership aspect and generally of course in any kind of an economic development one thinks about resources land labor capital and of course entrepreneurship which was added by adam smith in the father of modern economics essentially and i thought that this more than that running a nation is very similar but much more complex running a multinational conglomerate essentially so many stakeholders so many places as a nation you are in every country where you have a consulate or an embassy so you are truly global in many ways we don't think about that that the governments are global in by by, by nature of diplomacy etc etc and sometimes by defense so given that situation i try to tell that the angle that we have to talk about because we are both in management field is to look upon the role of leadership i like basically the biographies of leaders in the world both political leaders monarchs philosophers thinkers i like history in general 
So I had read the histories about Abraham Lincoln, for example. I teach that in my class right now, about his journey and what he did during Civil War, the whole transformation of the nation from basically a plantation-based economy to the most modern industrial economy. I also had read about Mrs. Thatcher more recently, her autobiography actually, and she made an enormous transformation in UK. More interesting were people historically such as Mustafa Kemal for Turkey, the Ataturk as they call him, the father of the nation. And he made a highly feudal, clannish, faith-based organization or entities into a massive, more secular nation and Turkey just took off. So there was something there. Because I was working at the government of Singapore, I saw the transformation being made by Lee Kuan Yew, the first prime minister. Similarly, working on China and India as a part of my institute, India China America Institute, I saw the rise of China. Deng Xiaoping, of course, was the transformative leader. So there are a lot of anecdotal experiences. And I motivated Piani uh, to say, let's focus on leadership and let's do the biographical research among all the transformative leaders. And the conclusion came out, Kritika is very fascinating. You can reform a nation in four or five years, but truly transform, go in a trajectory that never thought was possible, almost a mission impossible kind of a capability. It requires at least 15 years across all these historical evidences that we saw. Not only that, but you need a political continuity and the political stability. Those are necessary conditions, but ultimately sufficient condition is a transformative leader. And that's where the key difference came. So we focused on leadership in the process. And as uh, people again mentioned, the book is intentionally written for the reader. I like yes. it. <laughs> Rather than written for the academics, written for, yes. the, for ourselves kind of notion. And then Gyani was a brilliant writer. For somebody who was a Bitspilani graduate, he had learned the art of writing very well. So we began to work on those chapters. We revised several times. I wanted to also focus on attributes of great leaders. What are the characteristics? So we began to add those chapters on leadership styles and all the stuff. And the rest is history. I'm again so sorry the book did not publish before uh, Gyani passed away. I feel so sorry about that. So the book is dedicated to him, by the way. Thank you, sir. I'm sure, you know, wherever Gyani ji is, I'm sure he must be very happy today uh, to see finally how the book has culminated. And it's absolutely fascinating um, to hear that how this whole shift happened from writing about product management to actually writing about the transformation of the country. So I actually noted down some very interesting, I think, insights that I got while you were speaking. Um, you know, you mentioned at this point that, you know, Gyani ji was really piqued by, you know, his interest got piqued by the rise of India. And I think that is true as a, uh, as a sentiment that is shared by multiple people, not only Indians who are staying overseas, but even globally. Um, you know, the kind of transformation that the country has witnessed in the last decade has, you know, piqued the interest of everyone and actually sit up and take the, you know, notice of the India success story very, very seriously. Also, what's very fascinating to see is how you have beautifully combined a topic of management along with geopolitics, which is a great example of interdisciplinary learning. And I think, especially in India, when we are at, you know, an important junction in education where we are looking at successful implementation of the new education policy. I think this is a prime example, uh, so to say, of, you know, an interdisciplinary two subjects coming together and how, you know, you can actually produce great academic work out of that. And third, I think you made a very strong point there that typically reformation in any country would take about four to five years, but transformation at this kind of a level would take at least 15 years. And I think that's where the India success story has been very, very uh, successful with the fact that we have made this transformation from being a fragile five economy to a bright five economy now within a span of 10 years only. 
and um, it's absolutely phenomenal to see that how that entire journey and how you have traced all the political developments along with the socio-economic reforms that have been implemented very, very beautifully to explain and mix that with leadership that how that has been instrumental and key in the transformation and the transformational journey that the country has undertaken. Now, so you even mentioned about how you've always been fascinated by biographies, how you have always been uh, reading about various global leaders. Um, so in this book, you have studied, uh, you know, the nation's greatest leaders since independence. Strictly academically speaking, why do you think our Prime Minister Narendra Modi fits the template of a transformation leader? What is it that makes the PM a man of delivery and true testament to his slogan, which is very, very popular nowadays, which is Modi ki guarantee? You've also had the good fortune of meeting him. So we would love to hear some of the anecdotes from you. Sure. Uh, I met him actually when he was the chief minister of Gujarat at a vibrant Gujarat event. And he watched me, obviously, as to my speech I was giving on small and medium enterprises and how that's the sort of the rough diamonds in India and how can we shine them as opposed to just a large Indian multinationals, for example. I'm very, I was very fond of family-owned businesses. And so we were chatting about that one and he invited me to speak as a workshop. There's a Jagdish Bhagavati lecture or something. He invited me and he, his cabinet ministers, some of the industry people, they're all together at in, in Gujarat, where we really began to understand each other. Uh, very interesting. His dedication is incredible. I think he's the best student I ever had. Totally, totally focused, like a meditative zone. His ministers are wandering their mind, you can tell pretty much. As, as a professor, that's a knack of what you do. And he summarized my conclusion about how Gujarat can become a global hub for because of the location, infrastructure, etc. And he summarized that in like three minutes or five minutes, pretty much, which is why I got very impressed at that time. And then we began to meet regularly. The three, four ingredients he has, characteristics are very key. Really belief in the future of the nation and the potential of the nation. Not as much as traditionally we talk about the labor, the capital, the land, etc., but the human potential. Now how can we unlock the human potential? It's very mission-driven. Mission-driven people are having a huge ambition or aspiration. They see the potential in a way that you don't do, but they are very good about execution, which is very important. And he executes things that I've been amazed, whether those are monuments, whether those are temples, whatever turns out to be even policy change. What were very many initiatives that the previous governments could not do, he got it done. Second thing I liked is not only execution, but use of technology. He's very fond of digital technology, it looks like. You know, when you meet him, he really always is and then I admire that skill set to say, take a tool like a technology and use that as an enabler to transform the nation, transform social reforms, you can do it. Financial inclusion being one of the big ones through Aadhaar and you know, uh, uh, our platform for payment, online payment, for example. Uh, or, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> correct. Uh, UPI, that's right. But also transform the nation from being highly isolated to become a global, primarily, global orientation. Um, I think he has done a very good job of using the technology for governance. Everything has to be recorded. Digitize, 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 I think is a very key drive. So those are three, four characteristics that I'm very much, I mean, he's a doer, clearly. And then I, I found out that most of this, uh, case histories that we took from historical things, all of them were very good in terms of pragmatic leadership. Pragmatism or practical aspects matter. He's a very unique exception that most of the leaders 
you know, the nations have come from sort of the highly educated upper middle class. He, he came from a working class. That's a very unique one. There are a couple of others that we have not talked about, like Lula in Brazil. But that's very fascinating. So it seems like basically when you come from working class, you have an empathy built in. You, will, you are willing to meet the masses. You're not, like, you're not like isolated in an ivory tower in some fashion. Very practical in that regard. Very approachable in the process, which I've seen personally myself. And it seems like he loves masses and masses love him, clearly. Looks like. I mean, he enjoys that. The other thing which is more on a personal note is that he creates slogans on the spot. I mean, I've never seen any creative advertising people doing it like that. They agonize what slogan to write, but somehow it's so natural to him. I commented in my meetings, I said, I just can't believe, where does it come from? How do you get this thing? He's able to create a slogan around something which is why it becomes a rally point. And you've seen this across of many of the reforms and policies that he has advocated. I think that's very, very well put. And, you know, I was actually sitting and noting down what you were saying to uh, uh, sort of recapitulate it. I, and I think the last point, especially when he said that he has this knack of creating slogans. Uh, you know, so very recently I was talking to somebody and he said that, you know, he has this knack of creating opportunities out of adversities. So I I remember that, um, you know, um, I think very recently somebody had taken a jab at him about his family. And uh, he decided to change that to, you know, 140 crore Indians are my family and they are my, that is Modi ka paribar. And, you know, now we see that splashed all over that, uh, you know, 140 crore Indians are his paribar. So he has this amazing knack at, you know, creating opportunities out of adversities. And I think even the work that you spoke about, um, you know, there has been like eight, more than 80 percent of the population in the last decade has now become part of the formal economy, which is a great sign of financial inclusion. And nobody thought we'd be able to do that in such a record breaking period of time. And we've been able to do that. Honesty in governance, I think, is something that you pointed out, which has immensely improved uh, in the last decade. Economic reforms of various kinds, ease of doing business. There is a lot of work that has been done, which has truly, um, you know, made this transform uh, transformation journey that the country has undertaken truly very remarkable. But I think there's a very important point that you spoke about, which was how the world is now perceiving India. And uh, yeah. we see that, you know, there is this really positive reception, uh, that perception that is now being created of the country. I mean, it's very common that every second or third day we hear about that how either the prime minister or the country's progress is being spoken about, uh, you know, by global leaders, spoken being spoken about in other parliaments. I think very recently the Indian success story and the prime minister was being praised, were being praised in the Australian parliament. Um, so... I would like to understand that, you know, a world over, like recently I remember going through the Jeffries report, which also said that, you know, India is going to become the third largest economy by 2027. So it's not only us saying it today, but now it's globally world over uh, people, think tanks, you know, global leaders who are saying this. So clearly we are redefining world order. And that has been a huge part also of this transformation journey and a huge difference that one can see in the last decade. So what role do you think has leadership from an academic point of view played in this perception change that one witnesses? Uh, I think um, the 1991 economic reforms, which basically mandated liberalization and privatization, deregulation. There was a potential in the economy, but it was bottled up through license raj and previous belief systems like socialistic pattern of society. There's something, there's a different economic model and suddenly this new model seemed to work as it proved in China, for example, as it has proved in Singapore, etc. cetera. Uh, I think embracing that was a very key factor. What began to notice world began to notice the potential of India as a strategic partner on not only just 
consumer markets, but on everything in defense, infrastructure, as well as in politics. India is already number three in the economy on purchasing power parity. China is about $30 trillion as of last year's data. Uh, America is about 25 trillion. India is about $11 trillion. But India is underrepresented slightly because it has a huge cash economy. So the calculations are underestimated. We think it's about $15 trillion. Most importantly, I think, when it comes to the leader of a nation is that can you be as comfortable with all the different leaders with different ideologies, different personalities, and that's marvelous. He's probably the best brand ambassador of India. He can relate to Putin on the one hand with a different ideology, different governance mechanism, to, for example, Macron in France, very different ideology, very different personality, to three different presidents in America, from Biden administration now to Trump administration to Obama administration, for example, to becoming personal friends with Abe in Japan. Seems to rise about just being formality of reaching nation, doing all the formal ceremonies, but begins to have a personal relationship, personal friendship. They remember him for that, which again is very unusual to see a single human being being able to relate to so many diverse people. Angela Merkel was another one. If I think about the names, just goes on and on. I began to observe that. And I think there are very few leaders of the nation in India, but more likely worldwide who can do that very well. Like a master diplomat, diplomat's diplomat, you know, in many ways, but a lot of things. I've heard through grapevine, gossip, etc. he likes to be prepared. I know in my meetings, he's always prepared about something or the other, pretty much. So preparing yourself, knowing about the nation that you're visiting, making sure that in negotiations, you are as very knowledgeable. I think that's where the key skills that you've got to have. Most importantly, the journey that we are going through is to go from a restricted licensed economy to be a globally integrated economy, where trade and investment matters as much as diplomacy. Motivating embassies and consulates to have consul generals and ambassadors as trade ambassadors, brand ambassadors, not just diplomatic passport and visa and all that stuff. And how can we raise the nation from a low tech to a high tech economy, which is where we are moving pretty much. It's a two dimensional shift. With high tech, the high wages will come as opposed to more manual labor like in agriculture, for example, or in factories, smart factories in many ways. So to me, that vision is appealing to the people. Clearly India will become the third largest player I have an institute called India China America Institute. It's the trilateral power of these three nations that will decide the future of the world economy in general, but world politics. Unfortunately, China and America are distancing with each other. India is distancing with China. Therefore, the, by definition, US China, US India relationship will grow in the process. As we have seen all the body language from G7 nations meetings or G20 that we hosted recently in India. Everything seems to be in the right way, but the biggest change is none of this. This is all fine. To me, the biggest change is in self-image of Indians. From a hopelessness, defeatist attitude, there's nothing much I can do. I can do something. I'm somebody. To me, that positive self-image is very important because that makes you unlock your own potential. And he seems to have created that kind of a positive self-image. Worldwide, when I used to travel in my younger days, people would think about India as a country of roaming cows and snake charmers. That was the image. When I did a machine tool industry project of India's export potential, 1968, all over the world I traveled in Western European countries, that was the image of India. How can they be in machine tool industry? Today, people go and smile, they admire you in their body language, and they think that I'm an IT professional or I'm a scientist of some sort, which is very fascinating. I also think that this is the only government that has taken diaspora as a very strategic asset. 
motivated, embrace the diaspora as a positive force for the nation, utilize them in a positive way, whether you are a diaspora in the countries, advanced countries in academic life, corporate life, wherever you are, or diaspora in Gulf countries where you are basically well-established traders, merchants, whatever they are. Having diaspora power is very key, which I think this government has recognized more than anybody that I've seen. I've been out of the country about 62 years. I've traveled quite a lot. And again, both Gyanin and I felt the same thing. I was on the board of Wipro, so I would go four times a year, maybe five times a year. I would see the change, but it's incremental. Gyanin went once a year. He saw a dramatic shift. And I think both of us got very excited that ultimately we all need something that we believe we belong to. We believe in ourselves primarily. And I think uh, Prime Minister Modi has done a great job of saying that you can be somebody. You can be what you want to be, uh, which I like very much. Absolutely, absolutely. I I think, you know, uh, very correctly uh, stated by you, from the land of, you know, being known as the country of the land of snake charmers, we have now become the country with an enviable India stack, that digital public infrastructure that many countries now want to get into MOUs with us to actually acquire. And um, like you, you know, so you were mentioning about the UPI, I think um, the last year we saw this, especially during the G20 visits that happened, you know, various ministers, foreign ministers of the so-called developed nations were absolutely fascinated with how seamless and efficient our United Payment interface is. And, you know, uh, in fact, they were amazed at how, you know, people who may not have may not be very educated are also so easily able to do transactions very swiftly. So there is a huge monumental change in the perception that the country has seen. Um, second, I think, you know, this point, and I think that's a very important point of how, how Indians are now feeling a sense of positive confidence in being Indian. Like we can proudly say, you know, we are Indian. We are seeing a growing sense of national pride in the country. And one also sees that happen because, because of, you know, how empowered everybody is getting. Um, if you see in the last 10 years, you know, to, we can't even imagine that um, we are very privileged. Uh, we have bank accounts, we're part of formal economies, but what it means to somebody who did not have access to that formal economy. They today feel empowered with the whole jam trinity that we have of Jandhan, Aadhaar, Mobile that has made life seamless for so many citizens and made them feel so empowered with the number of houses that have been made, toilets that have been made. I think it has really improved the standard of living of Indians, which has actually given them that sense of empowerment and the sense of national pride. And diaspora, again, a very, very important point recently um, I remember reading that the Prime Minister was in the UAE and he did this event called Elan Modi. And it was absolutely amazing to see the huge turnout that uh, one witnessed, not only of it, the Indian diaspora, but as well as the Emirati population that was there to hear, uh, hear him speak. So that really shows um, that, you know, how he's truly a people's person and how he's touched um, the lives of so many people, you know, irrespective of uh, nationalities. Now, that brings me to the next question, which you have also dealt with in your book. We are on this journey. Now, what next from here? What is it that, you know, is next on the cards of the country? Like you said, political stability is key. Economic stability is key for us to continue um, this positive transformation that we're undertaking. So if you could share with us your thoughts on what the roadmap should be for the country to continue on this growth tra trajectory that we are taking. I think there are three elements. Um, the most important element is education. The new education policy of 2020 is transformative. It breaks from everything in the past to something futuristic both at the school level, as well as at the higher education. And I think new education policy document is phenomenal. Sometimes I feel like it may become a role model or a roadmap for other emerging economies, large ones like Brazil, for example. And, and it's very interesting, whoever designed it, whatever it is, as I read it and reread it to give lectures on that one myself, 
I, basically, it empowers the individual student, very flexible curriculum, all the artificial barriers that we put, put between IITs and IIMs, for example, are going away in some fashion. I think that's very key. So that's really one. I think the second major thing, which is a little more on the uh, economic side, is having the uh, um, GST. GST is a phenomenal transformation. The previous government tried so hard for 40 years to get it passed, but it got it done finally, removing all the inefficiencies. And at every stage, you have a tax mechanism. You're there for somebody who holds you hostage, essentially, for whatever reasons. I think use of the technology on the one hand, but making it a revenue generator, which says you don't have to have income tax rise anymore. As the government grows more and more, it needs more revenues. GST will substitute a generous enormous surplus, and we have just begun the journey. Uh, Kritika, I've been amazed to see here is a country where even today, 60% of all the products we consume are unbranded. Services may be even more. And about 70 or 80% go through unorganized sector. As we become more modern, contemporary, or new India in 2047, modern India, advanced India, we have to convert unbranded to branded economy and unorganized to organized retail in this country, which is happening. Uh, I think COVID was in a way a blessing in that regard, although it's a massive, massive destructive uh, virus because people had to deal with e-commerce. We had the infrastructure in place pretty much. So Flipkart, for example, or Amazon, began to deliver not just in metro areas, but all the way into smaller, smaller towns, not sure. rural population, necessarily, which is again very important. So, so I think GST has been a very transformative in terms of the fundamental change. People now using their cell phone to make payments, UPI rides on that, again, same thing. Uh, Aadhaar, UPI all come together, converge. The third thing is very interesting. I think that this government has recognized the importance, the scale, and the size of public sector enterprises. But you never used it for economic reforms. I mean, there's, the, the, the SBI is a very large bank. LIC is a very large insurance company. Many of the oil companies are very big. So how do you use them becomes very important. So to me, I think recognizing that Public sectors can contribute also, not just the private sector. There are initiatives where private sector may not take the lead for whatever reason. Maybe it's because of the risk involved, lack of probably failure, but public sector enterprises recognizing them and giving them the freedom to do what they have to do, running like corporations essentially. I mean, that's very interesting also, I find a lot fascinating. Again, most importantly, the initiatives about making social reforms for women empowerment. Long yes. overdue, long, long overdue. I mean, women, women decided they will empower themselves anyhow, okay? In many families, they began to, young uh, women began to say, I don't wanna be like my mom, I wanna do something differently in many ways. Well, I think it's very important. The role of women in society being not just homemakers, good moms and good, wives, but also contributing to the society. And I think that initiative will un unlock the potential of huge manpower or a resource, human resource, which I think is equally important. So these are the kinds of things, it seems like having this, what is called BHAG, as we call it, bold audacious goal, having this aspiration or a vision, which looks like mission impossible, but you get it done, which is why I think people are looking at India in a very positive way. Absolutely. So I think you're very correctly identified. I mean, education, the impetus that's been given to public sector undertakings, um, the implementation of GST tax, and more importantly, the shift from women development to women-led development, uh, which has been a key of this government. And we saw that, that, you know, when the new parliament came, the first bill that was passed was the Nari Shakti Adhaniyam, 
uh, which was a 33% reservation for women in parliament as well as the state legislative assemblies. Um, I'm sure I've been, you know, going through the comment section and there's a lot that has been coming from the audience. We do have, uh, you know, some time that we can take a few audience questions. So if anybody would like to have, you know, ask a question, the floor is now open. Um, if you could just raise your hand or probably if you could punch in your question in the chat box, I will be happy to take it. And I'm sure Dr. Shade would love to answer the question. Um, it, any... it might be easier if you read the questions put in the chat box. But it's up to you. You are sure. the moderator. Not the moderator. No, 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 please, please. I mean, uh, I would go by what you're saying here. Um, so if anybody has a question, I do see a certain comment here, uh, which I am going to read out. So, okay, Pradeep ji has raised his hand. Um, Pradeep ji, if you, uh, if the tech team could please unmute him, please. Oh, yes. sorry, I'm not a very fast typist, but so first of all, congratulations, Dr. Shaheed. Um, And I apologize, I haven't read your book. I plan to, uh, but just beginning of this call, I thought I heard uh, you say that reformation takes five years, transformation perhaps takes 15 some years. If, if that's the case, and if you put Moore's Law, or I remember Alvin Toffler's Future Shock, the impact of technology, is that a number that has changed? And how do you see the impact of leadership and that time going forward? So far, we have not seen the impact of digital technology, which is so recent. But historically, from the agricultural to the industrial to the service economy, that number 15 years is persistent. Abraham Lincoln, of course, was assassinated, but his journey began in many ways. FDR was another one, it took about 14, 15 years. Mrs. Thatcher was the same thing. Eisenhower in Germany. Then of course, uh, later on, uh, Helmut Kohl. Again, their length was about 15. Uh, Japan also the same history. Even in uh, South Korea, so the same thing. So through the industrial age, at least, the Moore's law has, doesn't apply. But you are so right that with the speed of change that we can make with the use of technology, it may be faster. Which is why, again, I believe this government is very, very right in terms of using technology to bring about a transformation, embracing the technology rather than not embracing the technology in many ways. So you're right, following Moore's law, if we come back again in 50 years from now, we may talk about the cycle compressing for maybe 10 years, more than 15 years. Very possible, yes. Yes, I think Dr. Jain has raised his hand, so. No, I, no, I just want to add something. December last year, you know, just like Dr. Shade has Padam Bhushan, uh, China, government has two awards. One is called the silver and the gold awards. They give to people for their contribution. And I was the recipient. An Indian guy getting the top award from the Chinese government. Amazing. Congratulations. Yes. So it, it, was, so it never happened. You. It never happened. But anyway, I thought <laughs> I would just share two things with you. November 19th, 1962, China attacked India. And yes. they came from the northeast part. In those days, it was called NEFA, Northeast Frontier Agency. Today, it is called Arunachal Pradesh. When they crossed the border, the first plane after crossing the, the mountains is a town called Tejpur, where I was born. In 1962, oh, wow. I, yes, I, 1962, I was admitted in the kindergarten class. I remember it very well. The superior, the teacher came to the class and said the Chinese army is less than 50 kilometers from the school. The government of India has asked us to vacate the town by 7 p.m. Wow. And we are trying to reach your parents to take you back home. I remember that evening we left. In those days, there was no bridge on River Brahmaputra. So we had to wait overnight. Next day, cross the ferry. And it took us seven days to reach a town near Delhi where my grandparents are from. 
1962, November 19th. 55 years later, November 2017, that refugee of the Chinese war was appointed as the president of the top business school in China, and that is Deepak Jain. So I'm just saying that for Chinese government to accept an Indian to become the president of the top business school speaks about the openness in China. What I mean is they didn't care where I was from because they wanted to make their school good. So the point I want to make is December last year, I get a call from Shanghai Municipal Education Commission because I was five years in Shanghai. And you know, Professor said very interesting question. He said, he said, Dr. Jane, from March 2020 to December 2023, the Indian stock market has doubled. Can you tell us what made it happen and what can China learn from it? That line was very significant for me. That what can China learn from it? I would like, I give you 40 hours to write a 3,500, a 3,500 words article and it would be published in Beijing daily. I had just very short time and I wrote that thing. My point is, whatever we say about China, they are also paying attention to India. What is Absolutely. making India grow? And if we are going to be the third great economic power, we are on a growth trajectory and China, if not down is more, it's like a flat. And so internally we may say anything about China, but they are still very curious to see what is making India so vibrant. And my answer to him was that the world today we call the VUCA world, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. I said, India is a safe country. And I say S stands for stable economy. A stands for F, affluent middle class. F for favorable demographics, destiny, and divinity. God is very good to us. And E, Jagdish, what you said, educational excellence. Our brand is going to be educational excellence. That's what made Professor say it myself. That is the DNA. So when people tell me, how would you brand India? I say India is the global hub for human talent. Yeah, absolutely. Everywhere, take my words. I was the first Indian to become the dean of a top business school. Now there are 69 Indian deans, I was told. Same thing with corporate CEOs, same thing with now political leadership. So this is our century. We all need to be together and see how we can help the leadership India to gain. I always say revenue is the urgency. Reputation is the currency, but respect is going to be the legacy. We want India to be the most respected country in the world. That's what I aim for. Beautiful. Sorry, I took too much time. No, no, that's no. beautifully put, Dr. Jain. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Shed, for including me in the book. Uh, I just get a small footnote, but that's very pleasant. <laughs> I mean, you have done such a remarkable job. It's so true about, I think, we will become a service capital for across all professions not just the call centers, but way high. We are becoming a research center now more and more. Yes. Uh, so certified accounting, for example, legal services, etc. The world will come. So I always say that if you're looking for a gold, you have to go to the gold mine where the gold is actually. <laughs> Which says Indian economy will be integrated to the rest of the world, even if we do not encourage in many ways but so long as we make it easy to do business with. So overall, it seems like the whole world wants to bless it. But your main yes. point is very important. We should not underestimate China. My institute yes. is of our way that the one way to stop any kind of a war is to make each nation interdependent on the other. Then I can't afford to go to wars, which is why this India China America Institute is designed to promote trade and investment across the three economies, which benefits everybody else. That point I think is very key. And again, main thing is very true that we as Indians don't have to become so proud that we become arrogant. In one of my books, Self-Destructive Habits, Seven Bad Habits of Good Companies or Individuals, 
is that we, we take success, we take it too seriously. And we are we we have to have greater the success, more modesty we should have at the same time. And I think legacy comes from good reputation. Thank you so much, sir. I think, you know, that's been a fabulous discussion on that particular point. And just there are a couple of questions that are coming in the chat box. I'm just going to try to quickly take some of them. There's one question on the infrastructure of the country. And I think uh, to give you an idea on the infrastructure of the country in the last decade, if we look at, uh, you know, one of the mentions was railways. So in 2013, our railway infrastructure, we had railway lines at 1,610 kilometers. In, the, in 2023, we can proudly say that we have 5,243 kilometers of railway lines that have been constructed. Similarly, if we have been asked about road infrastructure, um, I think roads, again, is something that we've done phenomenal work in. At 2013, we were at 18,371 kilometers of roads. And today, we can proudly say that we have 44,654 kilometers of four-lane highways. And because of this transformation that we've done in a record period of time, in fact, our Gati Shakti or our road infrastructure plan is being made available to a couple of developing countries now for them to ape it similarly. Dr. Sheth, there is one particular question that was very interesting that I would like you to take, which is how India should go forward when Western media does not recognize the social achievements and constitutional changes done by the present government. I mean, for somebody who's been staying overseas, what is your comment on the so-called anti India, you know, Western deep state media? There are two separate answers. One is to get the job done and the media will change. Ultimately, they hit with the reality. And that happens when there is something that's already accomplished, like what you mentioned about the infrastructure. And I will add two more infrastructures, which are very critical, expanding the airports, so many more, and expanding the seaports which are very weak. Uh, I think also probably the Western media will find out that if there is no sympathetic listeners, mostly that's of Indian origin, who begins to say what you're saying is so counter to what we experience, there's a counter reaction. So the media does respond to their own readers and how they feel. There may be a grassroots revolt to say this negative image about India is not based on facts, it's much more based upon propaganda, based upon ideology, whatever the reasons are. That, that to me is equally important. So I think, I think to me, every country faces media. We go through the same cycles in the US about any political leader, as it happens surprisingly in UK, as it happens in Korea right now, for example. So media is, is always a counterbalancing force. And the last one, of course, is to say, find out why they are doing it. In other words, what's the motivation behind? Is it really more just not to allow the government to continuously, pro like opposition in many ways, or is it really more genuine reason? Uh, there are, of course, issues with every country about uh, social reforms. You know? Social reforms are harder to manage or transition. Uh, and I think we have done that at the time of independence and uh, 1950 constitution, a lot of social reforms were built into the constitution, pretty much. I think we need to revisit our constitution after 75 years. Constitutions right. were at a time where the world economy was very different than constitutions of the future, essentially. Which is, I mean, through amendments or revision, however you do it, we need to re revisit that also. Pretty much, that's what I think. Absolutely. I think that's very true. And I think that's also something that we have started doing. Um, if yeah. you see the three criminal laws that are that were there in the country, all three codes have now been replaced because like you very correctly said, the context in which those laws were made were very different from the context in which the world is operating today. So I think that's a very accurate observation. There's another question that I think has been repeated multiple times on the chat box, which is that, yes, there are a lot of positives that one sees. There is great economic progress, et cetera, happening in the country. But at the same time, there is also this apprehension of weakening of democratic institutions. What would your response be to that? Uh, 
there are two responses which are controversial. One response is a democracy without discipline is an anarchy. There's a border line between democ democracy and anarchy, which I think is a key. Every democratic nation is worrying about how far democracy is going out of hand, essentially, which is creating its own consequences. Um, so the question is, future of democracy may be more what I have been calling disciplined democracy. Future of capitalism will be more caring capitalism or conscious capitalism. So to me, at a more macro level, it's a phenomenon worldwide, probably amplified by social media. That's, that's the one aspect of answering about democratic countries. It is not limited to democratic countries, by the way, which is the other very important point. You have protests in autocratic countries. You have protests where there's a single party rule. One party, the nominate people, uh, and still go through the elections. So protests are pretty much there, mostly amplified by social media in many ways, because today I have access to information. Somebody can be a good influencer to use the media. In many ways, what uh, Mahatma Gandhi did with, with writings, essentially, newspapers in South Africa, eventually organizing people in one sense fashion to take a stand on something that you believe in. So I think social media is the other area. I'm very much opposed to the idea that social media should be not allowed to be regulated. Every media has to be regulated. We regulate print. We regulated television when it came out. There's a licensing procedure. I think for whatever reason, we allowed social media to take advantage in many ways. It's a great medium, very positive force, but it can be used, abused in many ways. I have a book coming out, by the way, on, on, on this I've been cogitating for 10, 15 years. It's a book that's called The Seven Side Effects of the Digital Age. In addition wow. to addic addiction is just one. The second thing is happening with social media. We are living more and more like roommate family. We have no time to share things together within a family. And we're eating in the evening is a chore. Then somebody goes and does WhatsApp, somebody's on YouTube, somebody's talking on the phone, somebody's watching television. So the individuality is rising to a level within a family where there's a much more democratic issues in the family itself now, not just within nation level. It's happening in quite, all institutions are having the same issues. The social media influences to a level where it may or may not be appropriate in many ways. So which, which is the other part primarily? Um, I mean, uh, the TikTok incident in America is a very classic case right now. And there are people who make a livelihood from TikTok. They think social media like TikTok is very good. But then there are people who believe social media has also side effect, which is basically creating a lot of individuals who institutional influence going down essentially. And we need both. This family is an institution. One thing I really like about uh, the current government's view is that education should start not in high school or in colleges, but all the way to primary school. Children's university. In many ways, as other institutions are unable to do, education pick up the role. I do believe very strongly that the ancient wisdom has to be revitalized. Wherever it comes from, every culture is looking for something ancient that they did which was more meaningful. It got sidetracked by industrialization or by digital technology. How do we bring that back? Nothing. So I have a whole presentation on that one. That if you go back to the pre-literary days, pre-industrial revolution, we learned everything from three C's of learning. We learned from community. Community was a very important one as a guardrail. What you can and cannot do, or should or should not do. We learned from congregation, not formal religions, but just get-togethers of a belief system. Eventually, it got formalized into religions as we know today. And we learn from craft. Master craft gave you values, not just told you how to make a jewelry or how to make a part or something. I think that's the one that 
In the Industrial Revolution, we went to three hours of learning, reading, writing, arithmetic. It's only for craft side. Value side was ignored. But now with the digital technology, it will be three C's of learning. Learning can be basically interactive. Three I's, I'm so three I's of learning. Learning will be interactive more and more. There's more like a dialogue what you and I are doing. Learning will be integrated. There's something common between math and music. Both are languages. There's not some such thing as a left brain or right brain that I believe. Uh, that was a theory I was taught. I believed in it. Now I'm discarding it pretty much. That left brain, right brain is a dichotomy unnecessarily created by somebody. And the third one is learning will be individualized, personalized. Right. I can go at this. So I think this way technology may enable us to learn in a very different way. And half life of knowledge is getting so short. Pradeep's question about how fast technology is moving. I think even that thing, basically in software, half life of software is only 18 months. I studied Fortran. <laughs> People don't even know what Fortran is today. Fortran 2, Fortran 4, COBOL language. And that was it. Today, people know C++, which is obsolete. People know Symphony, all goes on. I just know the names. I have no idea what they mean today. Artificial intelligence with the chat GPT type mechanism coming in. Very interesting. So to me, we have to learn knowledge lifelong. Absolutely. There's no thing as a terminal degree. And one has to provide a mechanism for people more affordable, more accessible. How can you be a lifelong learner in the process? So, so I'm I'm very optimistic about the nation. No, I think that's wonderfully put, and I I see that a lot of what you're saying with I think a lot of us personally would resonate with it. Also, what you said about education, we can now see the decolonization of education that's also happening in the country where we're going back to the roots. Like a lot of things, like you said, community in personalized learning, etc., were actually part of our ancient ethos of education that existed. And now, thankfully, we are recognizing that tradition and we're sort of going back to that. And what you said about being a lifelong learner, I think you are a prime example of it, how you beautifully kept up with time. And the other person that I can think of is the prime minister himself, who seems to be learning every single day. Like you said, that when you met him, he was the most attentive student that you met. Um, and... It's absolutely wonderful. I would wish we could have taken more questions, but unfortunately, we're also running out of time. And uh, I think for the moment that we have all been waiting for, if I could request all our dignitaries who have joined us today, all of you have been shared with a copy of the book. So if I could request that all of us could, you know, uh, showcase the copy of the book that we have and officially launch the book that we've all been speaking about. Dr. Shade, over to you and you just congr congratulations to you and Vibrant Publishers for this wonderful book uh, that we have read. And I'm sure it's going to be, it's going to add so much value to the readers that were going to read it. This is one. <laughs> Can I request our tech team to quickly take a screenshot of this? This is a very historical moment. We need to keep this in frame worthy. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, for the ones who have not read the book, this is your time. Get your hands onto the book and you must definitely read it. I'm sure you would have seen from the conversation that we have witnessed how multi-perspective and multi-dimensional the book is and how it has captured so many varying different topics so beautifully. And with that, over to you, Professor Shade, if you could extend the vote of thanks uh, for today's function, please. Thank you so much, uh, Kriti. Uh, the first word of thanks goes to my colleague who is no longer with us. Uh, he kept on pushing me to get it done. Both of us were very interested in getting it done by 2019 election time, the second term. But both of us were busy. He got sidelined with his health issues. And he had basically given up because he was not so well. He primarily made the point that let's just not do it. I kept the thing behind. So I really owe a gratitude, sense of gratitude and a sense of loss in many ways. Very good human being, very brilliant student, a very brilliant colleague even for that matter. 
So that my first thanks goes to Gyan in the Singh or Gyani Singh as I called him. My second thanks goes to Kritika Yu. Yes. You're doing a fantastic moderating, incredible. At your age, what you are doing. Very kind. <laughs> keeping up the conversation, keeping it on the top. So again, thank you so much for doing this thing. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. <laughs> Wonderful Good. job. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. The third one is, of course, my colleagues from other institutions. There are so many directors and the deans of colleges or institutes of management, uh, Deepak Jain being one of them, of course. All of them taken the time to basically support this initiative, having the book release and be participative. Time is such an important uh, scarce resource now. So that's my third one. Fourth one, of course, is my audience here pretty much. So many people I see well, come from so many different backgrounds. So I've seen people from friendship, like Manuwai Shah, I see him from MSI, one of the largest importers of granite and marble, $3 billion business out of nowhere. Again, he's a very successful entrepreneur. I've seen other people from my own town, Atlanta. Suresh Sharma and I are writing a book together on the innovative university of tomorrow, what will it look like, pretty much imagining again in a way that's we are thought we are just wonderful every Sunday we meet for two hours. I mean, there are friends after friends here. Of course, uh, Sanjay Parade and, and Kalpana are there. I see them over there. So in many ways, a lot of friends. So I, am, I really feel a sense of gratitude that all of you have come to join in releasing this book. So thank you again so much. Also, of course, the team that puts together behind the scene, Jackson, Vijay Bhumi University has an enormous team. It was flawless. With so many connections to make it incredible. That team I always admire when I visit Bangalore, for example, and to talk about the, 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 the dedication, enthusiasm even, rather than stress, how can I get this job done right? So again, thank you so much for the technical team behind the scene. And of course, my own final, final, debt of gratitude and a sense of appreciation goes to my wife. She is the reason why I do what I do. Uh, now, 61 years we have been married, still supportive of saying, all right, if you want to work, it's okay, it's up to you. Uh, continue doing it, what you do, and taking pride on what I do. Nothing more meaningful contribution you can hear from your spouse than saying, more power to you and how can I help you? So, Madhu, I don't know whether she's watching or not. She was supposed to be watching. She is. Okay, she great. is. So, she is. That's great. So, so, Madhu, again, thank you so much for a lifelong journey. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. One, one second, Kritika, one second. Yes, sir. I'd like to add here that Dr. Shed had a podcast with Ananya Avasti, which yes. was released today morning, India time, and it is available on YouTube and Instagram and other links. I have shared the links on the message box also here, chat box, and we'll be sharing it on uh, social media platform of Dr. Shet and my handles. So if you want to go through that podcast, it has more insights also. Anybody can go and check it over there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please do check out the NIJ podcast with Ananya Avasti. And so thank you very much, everyone. Again, have a good good weekend. Thank you. Take care. Namaste. Thank, thank you, you for everyone joining for this thank program. You. Thank, thank you. Excellent. You are thank hard. You. you are hard for life now, okay? Done, sir. Anytime for you. <laughs> thank okay, you, thank sir. You. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.